Hello and welcome to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History for another Drawn to Nature event. Uh, lovely to see so many from familiar names uh, down there in the chat box. Um, my name is Chris Jarvis and I'm one of the public engagement officers here at the museum and the great news is we are open. Uh, we've been open for over a week. You can now come and visit us for yourself and draw inspiration from the building as well as from our Drawn to Nature series um, with some amazing uh, new exhibitions, some amazing artworks that we've had installed just for our opening as well. Um, now, if you haven't joined us before, we are using the webinar jam system tonight. So um, if at any point during the evening you do lose connection, there's a big red reconnect button at the top of your screen. And if you press that, that should bring you straight back into the room. Uh, and obviously, if we have any connection problems, just bear with us and we will try and sort those out as quickly as possible. Now, the other thing is we uh, we do like to see where people are, are calling in from. So do, do let us know who you are and where you're coming, uh, joining us from in the chat box. Um, and we do like to make these uh, these events as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions throughout tonight's uh, event, do type them into the um, into the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and click that little circle next to that uh, your comment or uh, your question. That'll mark it as a question and I'll be collating those and uh, putting them to our tonight's speaker uh, during our last drawing challenge. So on with the challenges and the format of tonight's program uh, event. It's uh, it's not um, so these, these aren't uh, art lessons. These are really sort of uh, sort of art, science, well-being events, which uh, which are designed to help you sort of find your inspiration and creativity from some of the beautiful specimens that we have around us in this place. So imagine it a bit like a, a little behind the scenes tour with one of our experts to uh, to hear about their passions, followed by um, some chances to get your sketch pad out and in whatever medium you're using to draw inspiration from some of the, uh, the exciting specimens that he's specially selected for you. So we're going to start with a 20 minute talk from tonight's expert and that'll be followed by two two minute speed sketching challenges which are which are just a chance to get your eye in and let your you know creativity find its marks on the page. That'll be followed by a, a six minute challenge which is a little bit more detailed. And then you're going to get a specimen for about 10 minutes, which is, again, a little bit more detail. We'll finish off with an amazing, uh, amazing couple of specimens tonight for a grand finale for 15 minutes. And it's during that point in time that I'll be putting your questions to, uh, to a tonight's speaker. Now, uh, don't worry if you feel like you're being rushed, you're running out of time. We just want you to relax and, uh, and enjoy tonight because you, you can rejoin, uh, revisit this and all our other Drawn to Nature events on YouTube. Uh, so if you want to finish off a piece of work and you've got a masterpiece in the, in the making, you can always rejoin it on our YouTube channel, which you can find at the top of our website. The other thing is we obviously like uh, nothing better than, than seeing the amazing creative things that you come up with. So uh, it's inspirational for us. So if you do want to share your artwork, do please post it on Twitter and tag us in with the tag at more than a dodo. dodo. That's, that's all one word, at more than a dodo, because uh, we love to see them. Now, uh, it's time to introduce tonight's speaker. So tonight's speaker is Rob Douglas, and he's a collections assistant here at the museum uh, who helps with the zoology and the entomology collections. Um, and it's his job to actually look after those specimens, curate them, go through them, and actually deal with the phenomenal number of requests we get from students and researchers all the way around the world uh, for access to our specimens, uh, find them and get them to them. Um, he also heads up the, uh, the rather glamorous um, pest integrated pest management program here at the, uh, the museum. Uh, a little thing that's, that's often overlooked is that not all insects are good in museums. Uh, we do have some that do like to get in and nibble their way through our taxidermy. So uh, it's actually uh, Rob's job to check over our, uh, some 7 million specimens for uh, these tiny little pests and, uh, and make sure they're not damaging things and keep our specimens for future generations which is uh, why he's heavily involved in the Hope for the Future project, which is uh, uh, a project to conserve and recurate our one million British insects here, which is one of the most important collections we have here with some of the oldest insects in the world, uh, which is very generously funded by the National Lottery Her Heritage Fund. Um, when he's not doing all of that, um, he does have a particular passion for the ground beetles and for the longhorn beetles, and he likes nothing better if he gets the time to actually recurate the, the glorious historic Baden Summer collection um, of Cerambicids, the longhorn beetles, which I think you might just get a taste of tonight. So without further ado, it does give me huge pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Rob Douglas. Are you there, Rob? Hello, Chris. 
thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm just going to start my presentation. Hello, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to be here talking to you this evening. As you can see from my first slide, uh, today's topic is all about beetles. The groups of beetles I do the most work on, as Chris has already alluded to, are the ground beetles, they're the carabid beetles, and then the longhorn beetles, the cerambicidae. There are actually some carabid beetles for you to spot on this slide. Up in the top right, we have the wonderfully named violin beetle. You can see where this guy gets his name. It's got this superb flat body structure that it uses to hide in between the frills of bracket fungus in tropical rainforests. It then emerges at night to hunt. We've got this glorious orange and green iridescent specimen in the middle here. And then below him, this much smaller black and white spotted tiger carabid beetle. As you can see from just this one family of beetles, the carabids, there's a huge amount of variation. These all look totally different. Now there is a longhorn cerambicidae beetle hidden away in this slide. Somewhere on the left is a hint, and I feel you may figure out why he's called that when you spot him. I hope you've been able to explore this slide while I've been talking to start to understand just how much incredible variation there is amongst the beetles. And if you were unfamiliar with this group before, I hope some of this has piqued your interest. However, before we get too distracted by shiny and spiky beetles, we need to know uh, how we know when we're looking at a beetle. And that all starts about how we know when we're looking at an insect. So next time you see something crawling around in your garden, what are you looking for? Um, well, the first part of the call is to identify whether it's an insect or not. Now, all uh, insects are invertebrates and they all belong to the phylum Arthropoda. A phylum is a very large taxonomic grouping of organisms that all share similar traits. In the case of arthropods, they all share several key features. Arthropods get their name from this first feature, and that is their jointed legs. You will also see on all of these very different uh, creatures that they all have jointed legs. The second feature you can clearly see is a hard exoskeleton. This is the armored shell, if you would like, of these creatures. Within Arthropoda, there are several groups that are not insects. We've got the many-legged myriapods, including the millipedes and the centipedes. We have the eight-legged arachnids, including the scorpions and the spiders, but also ticks. And then we've got the crustaceans, the largely aquatic crabs and lobsters, but also terrestrial ipods, uh, isopods, such as the woodlouse. Lastly, we have our beloved insects. But how do we tell them apart from the rest? Insect morphology uh, is very simple. All insects share some easily identifiable common features. On the screen now, you can see four very different insects, all from different orders. Centre stage, we have a lovely green flower chafer beetle from the order Coleoptera. In the bottom left, we have a stunning robber fly uh, with its huge eyes and long legs. This is an apex predator from the order Diptera, or the true flies. On the right, we have a beautiful plate diagram of some carpenter bees from the order Hymenoptera, the bees, wasps, and ants. And lastly, in the top left, we have a very curious Neuroptida species. This is from the small orders. Now, all of these look wildly different. However, you'll notice that they all have three uh, consistent segments throughout their body. No matter how different they look, they all have a head. This is the center of all sensory inputs. It houses the eyes, the antennae, the mouth parts and palps that may be used to pick up pheromones or scents. Then we have the thorax. This contains the mus musculature needed to power the wings for flight and the legs for movement. Lastly, the biggest section, the abdomen, contains all of the digestive and reproductive capacity of these insects. Once we've got our three part body plan, we've got the fact that all insects have six legs. This is one of the very few hard and fast rules in biology without any exceptions. However, it's not always completely clear to see. Antennae or maxillary pouts uh, can sometimes masquerade as legs. You'd be forgiven for thinking the antennae on this beetle in the top left of your slide uh, had eight legs. Some specimens hold their legs very tightly under their body and make it very hard to see or count them. Uh, and then, as we can see on our beautiful green flower chafer beetle, we can only count five legs. This unfortunately does not mean it's a rare new type of insect or a whole new thing uh, altogether. Unfortunately, often in life and in museums, insects can lose their legs and usually proceed fairly unfazed. So whilst we can only count five, we know there should be six because all insects show bilateral symmetry. 
that would mean that if I draw a line from head to tail and reflect it, they will look the same. So if I can count three legs on one side, we know that there should be six legs in total. So you've identified something with six legs and three body parts, and you found an insect. Now that you know you're looking at an insect, how do you know if that insect is a beetle? Well, we know all of these are beetles because I told you that they're beetles. But as you can see, the variation amongst them is massive. What are the common features shared by these specimens that would tell you that they are all beetles? While I give you a bit of time to mull over on that, uh, I'm just going to talk a tiny little bit about uh, the word hope. You might have seen hope scribbled on some of these labels throughout the images in this slideshow. The hope collection is the museum's entomology collection. It's vast and historic. And currently, it's undergoing a huge project. We have a dedicated team who are working to completely recatalogue and move our entire British insect collection. That's over 1 million specimens. This is a huge amount of work. It's NLHF funded, and there's lots of resources and interesting material for you to read on our website. Now that I've given you a bit of time to mull over what might make all of these beetles, I'm going to put you out of your misery, as it were. So here we can see a more detailed labeling of a beetle than the ones we've looked at before. Not all of these features are specific to beetles, but they're all useful identifiers. So the mandibles at the top are the beetle's primary eating tool. However, these are not unique to beetles. You might have seen them on ants or on wasps, but they do help to set them apart from some orders. For example, the butterflies with their long, thin proboscis. The pronotum is the armoured covering of the thorax. This is very common on beetles. This is a, a very generic one. We're raised in the middle and kind of flanges at the edges, but some of them have spectacular spikes and horns on them. The scutellum is a small triangular protrusion below the thorax. Uh, and you can see on this one, it features just there in between the two elytra. Now elytra are the real kicker for beetles. These are the hard and fast way to identify a beetle. Elytra are modified forewings of the coleoptera. So they're a hard protective covering for the fragile hindwings, which it uses for flight, and also the abdomen, where all of its digestion and reproduction takes place. They also where they get their scientific name, the prefix coleo, meaning sheafed, and the suffix terra, meaning wing, sheafed wing. The hindwings will be folded up or sheafed underneath the elytra when at rest. And when they set off, they will unfurl. The best example of when you might have seen this is if you have watched a ladybird just as it's about to take off for flight, those beautiful red elytra with the spots on pop up and out unfurl these wings that are clearly wider than the beetle is long and therefore must have been furled up underneath them. You will also notice that elytra can be, and this is a common theme, extremely variable. Some of them are black, some of them are beautiful colours, some of them are iridescent uh, wash of oil colours. Some are striated with long thin lines running down their length. Some are, look like they have pinpricks in. Some have uneven pot mark surfaces. Some are mapped, some are shiny, some are even hairy. Finally, we have the antennae. I'm just about to talk about antennae in more detail, but as you can already see, there's a lot of variety just in this one part of insects. So pointy bits, the bits that I've brushed over. Uh, here I'm going to talk about your mandibles and your antennae. So you've seen your elytra, you know you're looking at a beetle, but what more can we tell about them? Well, on the left, uh, here we can see a variety of species of male stag beetles, and these have highly evolved mandibles. Now earlier I told you that mandibles are the beetle's primary eating tool. Luckily for you, these mandibles are far too large and far too over-evolved for eating. So as much as it might look it, these beetles will not bite your fingers off. These mandibles have grown for sexual selection. They act as both ornamentation for the females, but also to intimidate other males as an indicator of physical strength. And when strengths are evenly matched, they can be used to grapple and wrestle. Longer, thinner um, mandibles might indicate the preference to sweep an enemy off his feet, whereas shorter, stubbier mandibles could be used to get a good firm grip, a good stance, and really wrestle your opponent out of your territory to ensure that you get to do the mating. On the right, We've got a selection of the different types of antennae that I was talking about earlier. What you might imagine to be the standard antennae is a moniliform antennae. We have one of these kind of sat in the middle here, this black one. It looks like lots of fairly equal sized blobs stacked on top of one another. 
but the forms get much different than that. Serrate antennae is probably the uh, most similar. These have kind of a light lump on each side. However, the pectinate antennae, the more exaggerated version of the serrate antennae, you can see on the left here of your slide, this is where these exaggerated bumps start to look like a comb, and we would call this a comb antennae. We also have the clavate antennae. These are clubbed ended antennae. You can see a really nice example of this down on the beetle at the bottom of your slide. We have the lam lamellate antennae, the fanned antennae, which you can see on a cockchafer there in the top right, which you might be lucky enough to see out and about soon enough, they're starting to emerge. Lastly, we have the geniculate. These are the elbowed antennae. Now you can see these on all three of our stag beetles on the left, but you can also see one on the right, and this is coming off the face of a weevil beetle. Other than that, there are two other antennae here, and I put these in as a nice example of the fact that antennae come in wild forms, spectacular colors, spikes, hairs, huge flattened sections, just about anything you could hope for. So you might have seen this phrase sneak into a couple of my slides, an inordinate fondness for beetles. The British evolutionary biologist J.B.S. Haldane is quoted to have remarked that if a god or divine being had created all living organisms on earth, then that creator must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles. At the time, he made this statement as it was widely regarded that beetles were the most specious group of organisms on the planet. And what I mean by this is that it was believed that there were more beetles than there were of any other group. So for example, more beetles than any flies, more beetles than any cats, more beetles than any dogs. However, since those, uh, since those times, the beetles have be de been dethroned by both fly people and wasp people. Alas, beetles still have the most described species with over 300,000. This is probably due to a large focus of them uh, on them when we thought they were the most specious group. Also, they can be quite easy to catch and they are typically bigger than some insects. But uh, well-respected studies and new theories based on habitat and life history have suggested that not only are there likely more flies, but more wasps again still. Now, don't worry, this doesn't mean there are millions and millions of species of your usual picnic aggravating wasps flying around. What this means is that there are lots and lots of parasitic wasps. These wasps are tiny. Uh, they spend almost all of their life cycle inside of their host insect, and they may be specific to that host insect. And it has been hypothesized that there may be one unique species of tiny parasitic wasp that lives inside most of its host insects for every species of insect, which blows all of the other numbers completely out of the water. What you might have also noticed on this slide is that beetles, again, are vastly different. If we look at the antennae of the Cerambicidae, the longhorn beetle on the left here, and the Staphylinidae, the rove beetle on the right, the big black and yellow stripy one, we'll see that the longhorn beetle's antennae are at least two times the length of its entire body, whereas the Staphylinidae's antennae is not longer than its mandibles. If we look at our longhorn beetle again, we can see that he's drab. He's brown and black and matte. He looks like he might be at home, uh, hiding on a log or in the leaf litter. And then we look at the iridescent blue plant beetle next to him, which looks like he's at home doing anything but hiding. We keep on our plant beetle. He's wonderfully smooth, almost featureless in a strange kind of alien manner. And we look back at our Staphylinidae, the rose beetle on the right, and he's covered in fur and spikes, just totally at odds with one another. Lastly, down at the bottom, you may have noticed the Goliath beetle, this large black beetle. This is actually one of the largest insects in the world. What you might not have noticed is that in between his horns there is a pollen beetle that I have scaled up so that you can see him as a nice size comparison. Some of you eagle-eyed viewers might have noticed that there's an exception to one of my rules here. The Staphylinidae on the right, the elytra only cover a small part of its abdomen, in fact, not even more than half. And I previously told you that all beetles had elytra covering their abdomen. There's always an exception to the rule. And in this case, it's the Staphylinidae. The last thing about this Staphylinidae is you might notice that he is uh, deceptively yellow and black. This is mimicry. So mimicry uh, is what species do when they want to impersonate a species that is dangerous in some way. Typically, that would be poisonous or venomous. By mimicking the yellow and black banding of some stinging hymenoptera, the wasps and the bees, the beetle is protecting itself. Predators are likely to recognize these colors, know that if they try and eat it, they'll get a nasty sting, and that it's not enough trouble, uh, it's not enough worth, and they'll leave it alone. Therefore, 
this beetle is getting a lot of the evolutionary benefits of having a sting, uh, be that a lower rate of predation, without the high energy cost required to produce venom, to store this venom in a way that's not harmful to its, itself, and also deliver this venom. It can then use this excess energy to grow and reproduce. We also have some record breakers amongst the beetles on this slide. The Goliath beetle, again, at the bottom of this slide, is one of the most massive insects on Earth. So that doesn't mean it's the longest, but the most mass. Uh, but that doesn't stop it being a capable flyer. Imagine seeing a 100 gram, 10 centimeter long, and almost the same as wide beetle flying towards you. And then lastly, the tiger beetle, much smaller, this lovely green beetle I haven't spoken about, is the fastest terrestrial insect in the world. It can run at, run at up to five miles an hour, which means you would actually have to run away from it. Uh, to put this into perspective, this is 120 times its body length per second. We can also see it has big eyes, large mandibles, and therefore we can infer some information about its lifestyle from the way it looks. Um, it likely, well, it is a predator uh, with its large mandibles. It hunts in the day with its large eyes, and it uses speed as its main, its main hunting technique, which is very rare for terrestrial insects. I'm going to change the pace a bit and talk a bit about insect conservation and more specifically beetle conservation. We all know that we're experiencing a global decline in species diversity and abundance, but how do beetles fit into this? There have been many papers published on the topic of trying to quantify the decline in insect species, and this is very hard to do. Insects are massively abundant, uh, they're hugely variable, and they live in all the habitats. So how could you possibly hope to monitor all of them to see how they're declining? For this presentation, I'm going to be using this, uh, this paper as a, as a benchmark, uh, suggesting a 9% per decade drop in terrestrial and an 11% per decade drop in aquatic insect abundance. This is a, a great indicator of why museums are so important, because uh, they allow us to infer this data from the past. So not only are our specimens labelled with what they are, but they're also labelled with where they're from and when they were found. This is vital. We can use this to see if specimens are still found in the same place. Are they still found in the same place in the same numbers? Um, how has that trend changed over time? Are they found in the same place, but at a different time? Have human factors influenced their life cycle? With all this data, how do we know where beetles fit into this? This is a, a study about insects in general. Well, beetles are such a diverse group, they fill many ecological niches. Some are terrestrial, some are aquatic, some are arboreal, some live underground. Some are carnivorous, while others are herbivores or scavengers or perhaps carrion feeders. If we know beetles fill most of these insect niches, we can infer that they are suffering the same population declines. So what's causing this? Well, there are several factors that put extinction pressures on animals. The main ones that affect beetles are habitat loss, climate change, and exposure to harmful insecticides, pesticides, and pollutants, especially for the aquatic species. So are all of our species of beetles dying out at an even rate? Well, no, not quite. We are seeing a sharp decline in specialist species. And what I mean by a specialist species is one that requires a specific resource or habitat to complete their life cycle. This could be a specific food, like a plant. It could be a specific type of wood, a species of tree, in order it to bore into, to um, pupate. It could be the presence of another species for a symbiotic interaction. If just one of these things are missing, the species won't be able to survive in this location. Generalist, generalist species can live in increasingly poor habitats. The way they do this is uh, by not limiting themselves to feeding off one thing. You might think, great, however, they can't, so they feed off many things, but they don't feed off any of them as efficiently as a specialist would. So that's why we have specialists in the first place. In some locations of where habitats are being reduced in quality, we're actually seeing an increase in abundance of these generalist species. So, uh, a really nice case study on this and a great example uh, of the decline of beetle populations is that of our most iconic beetle here in the UK, and that's the stag beetle. You may notice that you haven't uh, seen as many of these in recent years as you might have done. What the map on the left is uh, showing you, whilst it's a bit small, is that not only is the number of stag beetles declining, uh, but also the range is declining. Uh, their, their territory is, is falling in upon itself towards the, south, uh, the southeast. So why is this happening? Well, stag beetles are a specialist species and the resource that they require is deadwood. 
uh, to fulfill their life cycle. The females lay eggs in dead wood and the larvae then feed on the rotting wood underground as they develop. Once they pupate and hatch and emerge, the females don't disperse very far. They usually stay about where they've hatched. And then, so that's why you're much more likely to see the males as they go hunting around for females. This means that if there aren't large habitats connected by areas of dead wood, then you get isolated populations. And what happens there is when populations become isolated, they, they can't share as much genetic data. So they become more vulnerable genetically to things like uh, famine or, or pest species. So what we could say is that stag beetles have essentially lost this resource through habitat loss. Now this could be direct or indirect. This could either be areas of woodland being felled or it could be the way that in which woodland areas are managed. If dead wood is removed when it falls down, then there's nothing for the stag beetle to complete its life cycle in. So what can we do about this? Well, I'll start with what you might be able to do in your back garden. This is much, much easier. Piles of deadwood again. Great. Uh, not just great for stag beetles. Deadwood is important for a myriad of types of wood boring insects, especially beetles, but many insects. Um, another great thing you can do with wood is by drilling different sized holes into pieces of wood and also mounting them at different heights. Uh, this makes a great habitat for Hymenoptera. And the key here is that you're making as diverse a habitat as possible. By having big holes and small holes, low to the ground and high up, you're filling as many ecological niches as possible. In terms of your lawn, you might want to have, or you might have a patch of bare earth. Excellent, this is great for burrowing insects. Leaving your grass a bit longer, or even not having it all cut a uniform length. Again, it's making that diverse habitat. There's more niches if things are different sizes. And lastly, Wildflowers, particularly uh, native species, wherever you are, wildflowers offer a huge amount of food, be it pollen or nectar, to lots of species. And in turn, all these species they bring in offer food to predatory insects. On a much larger scale, uh, habitat loss needs to be minimized when constructing new towns or roads. And monocultures need to be avoided wherever possible. Now, monocultures aren't just present in farming. Things like parks are essentially a monoculture. A vast area of land, of grass, all cut to exactly the same length. It's just one habitat. You might see uh, fields of oilseed rape in bloom at the minute. Huge agricultural monocultures. Uh, and these are really not good for species diversity. Any specialist species that lived in that area that depended on something else will be gone. There will be some generalist species that can live just off the monoculture, but not too many. And then what you'll find is vast abundances of specialist species that do live off that thing. A nice compromise here are the beetle banks, which you can see a cross section off in the bottom left of this slide. This is a raised area in between crops where plants are allowed to grow wild and natural. And these act essentially as a population reservoir for beetles. Uh, these beetles frequently at night will come out of the beetle banks, enter into the crops where they will hunt on the, the pest insects um, that live in these crops. And this in turn reduces the need for spraying of harmful insecticides. Lastly, it's really important to remember that wherever possible, we plant native species of flowers and trees. Now, obviously any plant is better than no plant, but the reason it's so important to plant native species is that they've had so long to coexist with our native fauna, that the flora and fauna have evolved uh, specialized symbiotic relationships. That's where we get these specialist species from. They've had time to evolve with a single species of plant, for example. If you plant a native tree, it might have 30 specialist species, perhaps 100 specialist species that live on it, compared to much less on a, 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 a non-native tree. You might also have more generalist species that can live on that, and that is essentially a large abundance of plant feeding insects, or in other words, prey insects. And with a large abundance of prey, you, much, you get a much larger abundance of predators. So there's real kind of ripple effects through the, um, through the kind of trophic food chain layers by doing these things. Lastly, I'd just like to thank you all so, so much for coming along uh, and listening to what I had to say. I really hope that you've learned some new things about beetles, whether that's how to identify them, the different types of beetles, uh, the beauty of beetles, or the conservation of beetles. Lastly, I really hope you enjoy drawing the fantastic specimens that I've picked out of the collection for you. And I hope it's a really, really useful experience for you. 
Thank you so much, Rob, for uh, introducing us to uh, sharing your passion for uh, for this amazing, amazing group of animals. Uh, and we've got some wonderful questions um, for you. But uh, but now at home, it's uh, it's time for you to get your sketch pads out. Maybe have a quick sip of whatever you're drinking tonight, you know, whether it's a cup of tea or a nice glass of wine. And uh, time to start with our first two minute speed sketch. And this is a rather beautiful burying beetle. So you have two minutes.
again, touched on a bit when you said on the, uh, you were talking about the uh, the anatomical description of beetles and what makes a beetle a beetle, and you were you were talking about you know all beetles having elytra. Now, Miriam said, well, some bugs have elytra, so are they beetles? And so, what's what's the difference between a bug and a beetle? Hi, Miriam. This is an excellent question again. So, bugs uh, or true bugs, as I'm going to call them, uh, are hemiptera. And if you remember, I explained the name Coleoptera in relation to the elytra, that was sheathed wings. Hemiptera, again, that same suffix, terra meaning wing, hemi this time meaning half. And what this is in relation to is that half of the wings of the true bugs are hardened. And when I say this, I'm thinking specifically, and I think you are too, of kind of the green shield bug, where it looks like they have elytra. It's not quite the same, actually. It's the fact that half of that forewing is hardened. It isn't um, the best thing to think about elytra is is the way that they, uh, as as we discussed with staff the day, there are exceptions to the rule, but it's that complete like protective covering of the beetle. Oh, thanks very much, Rob. Um, so, is there anything that makes a a bug, you know, the hemiptrans particularly a, a bug? Um, I mean, I, I find that quite quite a difficult uh, difficult one. Well, funnily enough, hemiptera are by far and away the hardest order to define this with. Uh, they show some of the greatest uh, diversity among their order, essentially categorized into three different groups. Um, so there's only one thing that unites all the hemiptera, and that is their mouth part. They have what's called a rostrum. It's more similar to proboscis. It's a short, uh, sharp spine. It's a what we call a piercing and sucking mouth part. Um, most of them are going to use this to puncture into plants. I'm thinking perhaps aphids here and then suck out of them. But then you get things like assassin bugs that can use this to puncture into other insects and uh, suck out their contents. Now, Beth's got another question about, about the elytra and the wings. Um, she asks what constitutes beetles' wings? Uh, what, what are they made of? That is an absolutely spectacular question that I don't fully know the proper answer to. Um, all insects have uh, membranous wings, we call them. So it's a, a mishmash of veins, which are those harder structures that we see throughout the ring, and this membranous, very light, very strong substance. The key with uh, beetle wings is that, um, that they often have a kind of a two to three point fold in their wings. So there'll be a thicker vein at the top where you can see that the wing folds in on itself when it goes underneath the elytra. That's wonderful. Um, so um, getting a bit more technical actually with uh, thinking about what's on the inside of the beetles um, and their anatomy. Agnes wants to know, um, does a beetle have a heart? And, and if so, how, how fast does it beat? That's a great question, Agnes. So. Um, Beetles actually have what is called an open circulatory system compared to our closed circulatory system. What I mean by closed is you've got a heart and then you've got arteries coming out of that, going to all of your muscles and organs and then coming back in veins. Whereas beetles, uh, all of their organs and tissues uh, are in their abdominal cavity and their blood essentially kind of sloshes around, for want of a better word, this abdominal cavity. There's no, no real arteries or veins to speak of. They get their oxygen from a small, small holes in the side of their abdomen. They do have a muscle in the abdomen akin to a heart that kind of generates current, as it were. It sucks blood through and kind of pumps it back into the abdomen to, to get some circulation going um, to ensure that everything remains oxygenated. I don't know if uh, anyone knows the heart rate of, of the insects. I would imagine that it varies greatly depending on their on their life cycle. For example, the tiger beetle that I talked about earlier, the fastest beetle. If anyone were to have a, a fast heart rate in the beetle world, I would imagine it would be them. Excellent. Yes. I mean, if you're traveling 60 meters, uh, 60 times your body length in a second, you know, your heart's got to be going quite, quite good or the equivalent of it. Um, Laurie's obviously uh, really inspired by the colors on these, these uh, some of these specimens you've been showing us uh, tonight, Rob. And she said, is there any one color that's more predominant in beetles than, than another? 
Another great question. I would say that um, when you think of Beatles, when I think of Beatles, that kind of stock Beatle you think of is black. In fact, you probably think of a Caribbean Beatle, a ground Beatle, small black scuttling along the ground. And black is a very predominant color in the Beatles. But I haven't sold this service here by showing you all of these brightly colored ones. There really is a huge variance in color depending on the life history of the individuals. Darker colored insects, for example, Caribids, um, often hide uh, during the day. They're mostly nocturnal, at which point having color is of no use to them. Um, insects that camouflage in the leaf litter might be brown or green. Uh, but there is a huge variety of reds, the ladybirds, uh, purples and greens that you can see on your screen now, oranges and blues in the beetle world as well that you don't get in some other orders of insects. And they are absolutely stunning, those colours. I mean, imagine if all insects were uh, as iridescent as that. Now, uh, Kaylee is obviously really enjoying the uh, enjoy drawing the um, the violin beetle. Um, and he, he wants to know, is, is the violin beetle, beetle a British insect? Thanks for this question as well. No, the violin beetle, unfortunately, as much as I like it, it's not a British insect. It's actually native to the rainforests of Southeast Asia, specifically Thailand and Malaysia. Their populations are um, quite endemic to that, that region. That's really only where they're found. I've got a little bit more of a, a personal question for you. Um, so James asks, um, he says, hi, Rob. Um, if you didn't specialize in beetles, what would your fo you focus your efforts on? Thanks, James. That's a that's a great question. Uh, it's one I think about uh, fairly often. I spend so much of my time working on beetles, and I, I do enjoy their company so much. But uh, if I had to pick another group to really sink my teeth into, it would definitely be the small orders. Uh, I wish I could have shown you some pictures of them today. They're, they often include the most alien and primitive looking of the insects, insects that haven't changed for thousands, tens of thousands of years. And some of their life history is absolutely fascinating. The thing about their uh, their history, or more than their life history, their, their natural history, uh, Thomas Farrell asked, um, what are beetles' closest relatives? And, and when do beetles appear in the, in the uh, fossil record? Thanks, Thomas. Uh, this is a tricky question. Fossil records and insects uh, don't necessarily go hand in hand. It can be quite... Uh, difficult for them to be consistently preserved. However, I would say a really good starting point is a preserved confirmed beetle start appearing in amber in fairly decent quantities in the early Cretaceous period. Now, uh, what are they most closely related to? Another really difficult question. If you remember me earlier talking about how things used to be grouped morphologically, you might be forgiven for thinking that perhaps they were most closely related to the true bugs, as was spoken about earlier, how they look quite similar. Again, genetic mapping seems to indicate that they're actually more closely related to the uh, flies and the moths and uh, slightly more distantly to the, the bees. So um, I'm going to ask you another more personal question, actually. Um, Abigail wants to know, what's your favourite beetle or at least your favourite family? Uh, now, this is another this is another great question. What is my favorite beetle? It's a really tough question, and it's one that the answer changes to on a fairly regular basis, I must admit. However, the Saladonaphus, which are the Cerambicillae beetles that you're drawing now, these two specimens are actually the same species. It's such a variable species, uh, completely different forms and colors. Um, and I must admit that these are one of my particular favorites in the museum. Now I've got a, I've got a question from Stan that I'm going to have to ask you because uh, it tickled me as it came in. And Stan uh, has asked, "Would you rather fight a beetle-sized man or a man-sized beetle?" Now, thanks for this question, Stan. I'm sure a lot of people have been wondering about this one. Uh, it's a hot topic in the entomology world. <laughs> I'm going to have to go for a, a man-sized beetle here, which might seem like a strange strange answer. You know, we're just looking at the, the pincers and the claws and the teeth on this guy uh, on your screen. However, insects are essentially have a hard limit on their size because of their circulatory system, which I explained to you earlier. Um, as I described, they only intake oxygen through kind of a small, small selection of holes in their abdomen. They, they don't actively breathe it in in the same way that we do with lungs specially designed for oxygen transfer. As a result of this, they can only grow so big. A beetle-sized uh, man would not get enough oxygen to oxygenate its blood and power its muscles, and it wouldn't be able to move, uh, let alone really live. And this, this kind of, we know this is the case because 
going back to the fossil record, we find evidence of much bigger insects than we would ever find now. And we know that those periods in time, uh, based on geological research, were periods where there was much more oxygen in the atmosphere. And this essentially facilitated their more inefficient oxygen exchange systems, if you will. So a man-sized beetle would, would have no way of defending himself. And actually, uh, Abigail has commented after that, uh, imagine being hit by a beetle the size of a tennis ball. And uh, I certainly do know uh, someone who was uh, who was looking at, uh, at dung beetles in, in Africa and, and riding a motorbike along a, a road at night and, uh, and was actually hit between the eyes with, by, a, by a flying dung beetle and was knocked off their motorbike. So uh, yeah, I think they can be they can be fairly, uh, fairly uh, forceful on the, on the, in their own scale. Um, now, um, we've got a time for just a couple more questions. Um, Beth wanted to know um, how much, you, know, you talked about conservation and the, the importance of, of conserving our, uh, our invertebrates and our, our beetles. So Beth wanted to know um, how much are beetles impacted by uh, companion animal insecticide treatment? So I presume she's talking about, you know, flea treatments for cats and, and, and dogs and things like that. Really interesting question, Beth. Um, it's so it's it's always hard to quantify these things uh, because nature exists in. I like to think of it like a scale. Uh, it's it's all a balancing act, and if you think about food webs, it's all massively interlinked. So it's it's hard to quantify that X chemical does this to Y beetle. What we can infer though is that um, we know that um, pesticides. Uh, that might not directly kill beetles as we go up the food chain so you might start with plants and then you start with a very small plant feeding beetle and then perhaps a larger beetle and then a larger beetle as we go up that food chain the level of toxins inside each level uh, increases in concentration so it has a real impact on predatory beetles because they're getting a higher dose of these chemicals when they're eating other beetles or other insects as it were that have been affected by them well, thank you very much, Rob. That's absolutely fantastic. And I, I'm afraid I think we've we've run out of time for questions there. Um, it's, it's just worth saying that Stan has uh, has just commented that you're a braver man than I, Rob. And, and thanks for answering that question about which you'd rather fight. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. So thank you once again, Rob. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed tonight's Drawn to Nature. Do remember um, that if you want to revisit any of these talks, they are on our YouTube channel. So don't worry if you haven't quite finished off your artwork. And when you do finish your artwork, do please post it on Twitter and share it with us uh, with the hashtag at more than a dodo. So we can we can see just what wonderful, uh, wonderful artistic representations you've, you've done and how much our specimens are, are still uh, still inspiring people out there and it's worth saying as well in two weeks time uh, our next topic in the drawn to nature series will be sharks so we'll be getting some interesting specimens out for that one and we hope to see you then but thank you very much and good night